Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back from the break. Draw your attention back to the front of the room and away from the goodies that you've just had a chance to enjoy. My name is Wyatt Wasserman, and I have the pleasure of getting to lead the best session of the day. <laughs> Uh, we've had a pretty amazing agenda looking back over the course of the day and seeing what you've heard and what you've been able exposed to. Um, you've really had a chance to see sort of key aspects of how we move the genomics field forward. Uh, but underneath all of this, in terms of the potential that we have, is data. And as we think about data in, in genomics, um, we take and we look around the world and we see how others have, have worked with it. And what we find in those studies of, of those places is enormous challenges that we have in terms of how do we capture data, how do we organize data, how do we find ways to make data exposed to be allowed to work with it, how do we get data that's clean and actually useful as opposed to data that's a schlocky mess underneath the systems. Um, these types of problems that we have on the data side are the constant challenge when you look across the world. And what you find is a few places in the world that have really got in front of it and have been making real value out of it. I don't think anyone solved it completely. But there's some places that have really found ways to, to do it more effectively. In BC, uh, we've been putting a lot of emphasis on it. And, and uh, Dermot Kelleher, when he came in as the Dean of Medicine here, said, OK, in BC, we have the potential. We have some really interesting data resources. And one of the things he did uh, in that process was to say, well, I know this amazing guy. Uh, and uh, uh, Andrew Morris, who's been sort of leading the data charge uh, in a few different roles in, in the greater UK over the last few years, uh, has come back, this is his third time through, uh, to visit us in BC. I'm going to be conferring with Dermot about potential honorary citizenship uh, for British Columbia, and we'll see what we can work out there. Um, but bottom line, uh, in sort of the transitions, after sort of getting uh, rec recognized this year, I guess, as the commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, is that the, uh, the current status, uh, which is always lovely. But I think the far more important thing to you is that your role in, in the Health Data Research UK where you've really taken on a leadership role and, and started to take, take the lessons that you've learned in, in various stops along the way about how do we start moving data forward. And so what I promised the team today as they're going through the presentation is that I'm going to be extremely brief. This is the longest you're going to hear from me. Uh, I'm going to try to keep them on to time so that we can get our, make sure we protect some question and answer time in the world. And most importantly, I'd like to welcome Andrew Morris to take us away. Thank you, Wyatt. pleasure to be back. It's, it's actually, because of Brexit, it's a passport I'm looking for. Um, so, um, so I'm going to talk about detail and scale, and I'm going to try and convince you that if we're really going to realize the benefit of the outstanding science that you have here in genomics, we need a statewide or province-wide data strategy. And if you're going to deliver it, it will require really close collaboration, probably never seen on a scale before government, academia, service delivery, the public and industry. And that's, that's really the grand challenge. So I'm going to canter through this. So what I'm going to talk about is how we, we've been trying to do this in the UK and talk about this convergence of care and research to create learning of systems. The catalyst is data science which to me is the interface between mathematics, statistics, computational science, and domain. And we're, we're sort of health and life scientists in this room. Any, any statisticians in the room? Right. <laughs> <laughs> any mathematicians? One. I said, he's an outlier. There we go. So, uh, uh, any computer scientists? So that's not bad. So in five years' time, let's have 25% of each. That's the challenge. And with big data goes with big responsibilities. Uh, just to panic, Wyeth, because everyone's been keeping to time, I'm going to say in the next three hours. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and they talked talk about the NHS. NHS. This was, we've got to celebrate, it's 70. It's outlived 14 prime minister. This was Bevan in Trafford General Hospital launching it. Some people suggest this is Mrs. Thatcher in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the most ambitious adventure in the care of national health any country's ever seen. 70 on the 3rd of July. In the same year, something exciting was happening in this place. So this is Framingham Town Hall in uh, Massachusetts, about 40 miles due west of Boston. 1948, all 5,000 town residents 
subscribe to a series of regular health checks, and now are three or four generations, and it's iconic, about two and a half thousand papers, more than wild. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Claude Lafont, when he was uh, president of the NIH, suggested it has, has transformed um, the, the American art. What did it tell us? Framingham was about phenotyping. It was really one of the first deep phenotyping studies. And there's Lafont's quote, has resulted in an average of four extra years of life. Quite remarkable, isn't it, for a study of 5,000 people. And if you go onto the Framingham website, they with classical American modesty, uh, suggest <laughs> we are the town that changed America's heart. And they did for 5,000 people. But what they did is they phenotyped people very, very carefully. And I would argue, Pascal, the phenotype is more challenging than the genotype. So we should have, have a straw poll at the end. But we're in a new era. We're familiar with the fourth industrial revolution. This is Davos in Switzerland. The World Economic Forum say we're in a new age. You know, uh, from the first mechanical loom through electrification, through uh, the, the IT revolution, into the digital age. Why? It's transforming every industry in every country. The rate of change is exponential rather than linear. And what we're seeing is a fusion of biology with physical and computational science. And the, the opportunity for a genomics BC is to harness this revolution. But to do that, we need to think about maths, statistics, computational, physical sciences, if we're going to do it. The other thing we've got a challenge is in the UK is productivity. So we've just fallen off a cliff, actually. This is GBA per capita. Um, and one of the opportunities to close this gap is through automation and innovation. And that could be our health service, and that could probably be your health service. It's, it, they're riddled with waste, variation, and harm, because we're still using paper. So if you look at high-performing health systems internationally, what are their characteristics? This is a bit of a busy slide, but Barker, who's in the sort of improvement world, suggests there are 12 key features. You can cast your eye on them, but two are important. Comprehensive information infrastructures and whole system intelligence often in real time. Information continuity across journeys of care. And the second one is R&D and I, research and development and innovation, baked into the system. So instead of the researchers over here, there's really close proximity between research, development, innovation, and the system. So-called learning health systems. And if you go to, this is Duke, you know, and Geisinger, they talk about this information continuity. They actively manage care coordination and transitions. And they're data enabled, so they continuously innovate, research, and learn. And I think that's, that's certainly our thesis in Health Data Research UK. But how do we get this convergence of care and research? So why we're doing this in the UK is because our politicians say we should. Um, so they say we're going to have a digital-led NHS by 2018. Uh, my top medical journalist is called The Sun. Uh, <laughs> computers will replace doctors in just 10 years, says Jeremy Hunt, so it, it must be true. And, and our, another great leader saying that we're going to use technology to drive in, um, sustainability of the NHS. Why now? You're familiar with this. Leroy Hood, who was here last year, enabled, 4P meds enabled by genomics, phenotyping, informatics, analytics, and this new social contract around data sharing and trust. So I think those are, those are key issues. So I met Leroy last year, so I made this slide and I gave this talk, I showed this slide to a bunch of NHS finance directors. And one of them put his hand up at the back and said, you missed out a P. And I said, what's that? He said, parsimonious. <laughs> but he's right, if we just keep adding costs to systems, it's not gonna work. We've got to think about value. So why scale important? So this is a thought experiment as we understand the molecular basis of cancer. And we're going to hear from Marco about this. Cancer is actually a cluster of rare diseases. So if you think of a, a tumor, perhaps a lung tumor of a biomarker mutation frequency of 1%, to get 250 <laughs> incident cases a year for a clinical trial, for example, would require a base population of 47 million people. 
And as you go across the rarer cancers, the numbers just become really, really challenging. So that's why we need initiatives like the Global Alliance for Genomic Health, that we can share and actually tease out these, uh, these rare cancers. Shown for cardiovascular disease, this is a Rory Collins slide, 5,000 people. This is framing them. This showed the relationship between blood pressure and mortality. So you sort of see it, 5,000 people, 50,000 people, UK Biobank, 500,000 people. So it shows you how scale is important. And allied to this, because we're thinking about you know, 10 million whole genomes within uh, uh, 8 to 10 years, we're going to need strong data engineering. This is where the computational science comes in. Currently, we compute in health services probably at the terabyte scale. Soon we'll be at the petabyte, but we'll need to be able to compute at the exabyte scale. So, and this isn't something you can have in the backyard of your hospital. You need to do this. So why now? You'll be familiar with this, Cambridge Analytica and um, Facebook, major issue around public trust. So my thesis is that there are huge opportunities for data science, okay? Um, so some principles. Moore's Law, I don't know what Moore's Law is. How many data scientists in the room? Why Earth? What's Moore's Law, do you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the number of transitions. Fantastic. Well, why? Potential, potential computational capacity doubles every two years. Okay. What about Cooper's Law? Ah. Marco, do you know Cooper's Law? Absolutely no idea. <laughs> Good. That's the right answer. So, so the transmission capacity of data doubles every three minutes. Because we're very interested in curated data. Most data are now actually social media or sensor data. Internet of Things. It goes on. Metcalfe's Law. Now, this is an important one. This is why Facebook is so, so dominant in the market. The value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of its users. So basically, if you've got two landlines, you've got one point of connectivity. If you've got five, you've got 10. If you've got 10, you've got 66. So Facebook's got a billion users. Imagine what. So that's why they are so dominant. Aaron's Law, this is one for you, Pascal. Do you know that one? Um, Edward Markle. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the cost of a new drug roughly doubles every nine years. And that's the challenge. That's why we're looking at precision medicine. So I thought I needed a law. Uh, so my law. And I've been working with these chaps. And so the affluence of computer scientists increases by one teacher size every five years. <laughs> so our thesis is that we're trying to translate <coughs> excellent in life sciences through the world-class patient care using, using data and become very data-enabled. But look at, the, look at the quality and the cost as well at the same time. So when I was here last time, I was here on the 13th of June last year, I talked about Scotland. So we have a population of 5 million. We managed, we're not there yet, but to, to join this stuff up. So we're very good at measuring process of 16 million GP appointments, one and a half million hospital admissions, that sort of thing. But what I'm really keen that we do is to move to real-time measurement of process and outcomes, so deep phenotype across both structured and unstructured data. And we can do that because we've got a unique patient identifier, so what that allows us to do is follow journeys of care. Primary, secondary, tertiary, now social care, use this number. And that allows us to collect data once and use often, not only for care, but for intelligent research to inform how the, how the health system and, and, and original research works. And so, and I think you've got this in BC, but please join it up in a trustworthy way. So we've got you know, births, immunizations, child health surveillance, tissue banks, imaging, we've got the 26 million archive of the nationwide tax system, GP consultations, prescribing, we've got all this stuff. And now we have the ability to link to non-health data sets as well in a trustworthy way. And to do that, we've created a national safe haven with regional instances as well. We do we public engagement communication with everything we do. We bake it in because they inform the design. 
we uh, respect the data controllers uh, and have a public interest test for each project, and we make sure projects are worthwhile and ethically sound and approved. And we have a concept of safe people, safe data, safe places, and safe outputs. So we have no data travel. So it's like a multi-tenant research environment. And actually, the University of Edinburgh hosts this, so it's on the national supercomputer. It's 100 million pounds worth of kit. But rather than the NHS building this, we act as a data processor on behalf of uh, the research, NHS, and actually industry for the country. GCHQ checked our data security, and we've now got 400 projects coming in, so we don't send data out to allow analysis. And that includes genomic studies, and tissue studies, uh, pharmacogenetic studies, etc. So a few examples, five million uh, uh, patient studies, this is, is in the New England Journal, policy, hospital admissions for acute asthma, pre and post smoking ban. So you can do all sorts of studies. You can look at nationwide prescribing, you can look at drug safety, um, you can start to look at unstructured data. This is some stuff we did with Watson Oncology to create an annotated record of you know, very complex pathology reports. This isn't our stuff, but this is how you apply deep convolutional neural networks to skin images to actually outperform um, uh, certified grade dermatologists. So this guy, Sebastian Trun, was head of R&D at Google, now working in life sciences, and he can differentiate malignant melanoma from benign seborrheic keratosis. And he wants to put this on a mobile phone so that you can actually sell it. You get the idea. This is some stuff we did looking at uh, mutation in SLC2A2 and metformin response, and it's the equivalent of about 500 milligrams of metformin. The key to this is, is from routine data. It's not a specific study. We use data and consented DNA on top. So that's the sort of thing, but we want to scale this to 65 million people, and that's, um, that's what we're trying to do. So what are the big issues to do this? So this is a complex environment of the UK, and I'm sure BC or Canada would be similarly complex. So key to this is interoperability, to work across systems with no additional effort. Because people in this room, we all waste so much time at the interface. So how do we drive interoperability? So that's the big challenge. Second issue is a tidal wave of data. When I graduated in medicine in 1987, this was state-of-the-art computer technology. Do you remember that? <laughs> Does anyone not remember that? <laughs> Any youngsters? Yeah. And that was a big one. That was 1.4 megabytes. So where are we now? Gigas, teras, I talked about petas, exas, we're now to zettabytes. Okay. Um, and other industries are doing this. So Google. 15 exabytes. This is Peter Hicks, Nobel laureate. At CERN, they, they accrue 30 petabytes per year. This is the square kilometer array, the biggest telescope in the world in Chile. That will accrue 10 petabytes of data per hour. So other industries are doing this, and it's time that we, we, we were more professional and industrial. Infrastructure as a service, software service in healthcare. Because as Leroy and John Madison say, healthcare is becoming increasingly data intensive. Third big issue, and I was chatting to friends, it's a big issue in Canada. You know, we, we, we talk at this meeting about personalized medicine and prescriptive analytics, but will that land on a health system if they're down here in terms of their digital maturity? So I think in assessing how digitally mature your health system R is very important. We did it, and we were pretty shocked, actually. In the UK, we're sitting at two to three on that scale, not eight, which is where we need to be. So the digital maturity of health system. I'm pleased that that led to some strategic investment, and in the NHS, they're putting four billion pounds into uh, digital maturity. And there are examples now across the UK, this is East London, of, of these journeys of care being linked across primary secondary <coughs> tertiary. Fourth big issue is direct to patient recruitment and apps. So, Apple Research Kit, has anyone used it? 
great tradition. Stanford, you know, they attracted 11,000 volunteers in one day after releasing their app. So I think we'll see a lot more direct patients. So the NHS will not be as, as big a player in the UK. This is probably one of the biggest issues, standardization. So this is Ewan, my mate. He phoned me up. He says, Andrew, I'll send you the list of the top 20 ways we prescribe metformin. I said, that's very interesting. And he said, I'll send you the bottom 20 ways. And some of this is just like spelling mistakes. Take one Twix a day, and one tablet Eve meal one. Take one two times a day with M. I don't know who M is. Uh, um, but for metformin alone, there are 5,000. So how can we have precision medicine don't have precision prescribing. Uh, the sixth big issue is harming interdisciplinarity. So this is my mate Dave Robertson. And so I actually uh, established myself in the computational science department four years ago to learn more about these multiple technologies. And what we're seeing is not only a re remarkable advances in a linear fashion, but confluence of technologies. So how we embrace these in medicine is a big issue. And the last issue, the biggest one of all, is trust. Um, the Royal Statistical Society suggests we have a trust in data deficit. And we're really trying to push this notion of use of personal data for the common good um, at scale. And I would point you to something called understanding patient data. Oh dear, one minute. Can you put a zero on the end? <laughs> <laughs> so, Understanding patient data. We've set this up, Welcome Trust set it up to actually encourage the public to lead the dialogue on this social contract. So what's coming up next, and I will fly through this. I, I commend this report to you, Tech Trends 2018. This tells you what's currently in development globally. Smart watches, smart shoes, tattooables, smart glasses, smart bras. You know, this is, <laughs> it's, it's all happening. But, um, <laughs> There's some key messages which I quite, quite like. 2018 will mark the end of the traditional smartphone because we'll, we'll be moving towards connected devices and a new era of commuting, computing by, uh, commanded by voices, gesture and touch. Secondly, everyone should be paying extremely close attention to China. And that is so true. They are throwing walls of money at this. So data science across all the industries. I'll fly through this. AI is currently overhyped. It's full of misplaced optimism and fear, um, but they will get there, is my view. This is an issue from the last session. Policymakers won't be prepared to deal with the new challenges that rise for emerging science and technology. I think that's, uh, uh, that's an issue. <coughs> this issue of technology convergence is big. And lastly, Facebook, general pay, uh, data protection regulation, we will see separation being more a feature of the so-called splinter nets, so that we do separate, separate data. And lastly, we'll see future consolidation. So in the last minute, I'm allowed one more minute or not? You sure? <laughs> Sorry. So we're trying to pull all this together. So that was the, the funders were great. They've made 200 million pounds of investments across the UK. But the risk is fragmentation. You've got to try and bring it together. So we set up a national institute for this called Health Data Research UK. And the idea is to harness data science for the United Kingdom, research expertise, enabling new scientific discovery from large multidimensional data sets, embracing technology with a pathway to impact to healthcare. So we're doing three things, very briefly. Training the next generation science, and producing a UK-wide data fabric, so-called information commons to enable people to share data in a trustworthy way. And I'll go through this really quickly. So this is, uh, this is the desired impact. We set ourselves up as a separate legal entity, a charity, so that we are institutionally agnostic, and we've put the, so we're very lean at the center. I live in the Wellcome Trust. <laughs> But we've got 23 organizations to subscribe to a single set of terms and conditions, and we've got an initial funding of about 115 million pounds. So that's our structure, but we're independent. So it's not a university doing it. We are 
holding the pattern but very lean and coordinated from the center. So I'll go through this. We've got a very strong board. We've got six substantive sites. We had a competition, so this is where we are in the UK, 23 universities, including Cambridge, EBI, Sanger, Oxford, the London cluster, etc. We've got buildings where people breathe the same air to do this stuff. We've got a great senior scientific team, which, which guide, guide me and others along the way. And we've been around the country, as you can see, there they all are. Um, and we're, our initial research priority are data analytics, precision medicine, 21st century, century trial design, and modernizing public health. About 30 million pounds into those priorities. Training, looking at career pathways as well as uh, capacity in general. So we, we've got about funding for about 250 health data scientists across the UK who were trained in clinical and non-clinical. Physicists, astronomers, meeting clinicians. And lastly, we're doing data hubs to create regional safe havens for populations of two to five million people. Uh, Alan's talk this morning was terrific, and we're doing this on an industrial scale with industry partnerships. Shown schematically here, so we've got a national data services platform. We've got the local health and care records, which are being funded, and we've been asked to deliver these abstracted digital innovation hubs for multidimensional. And those are some principles of those hubs. Partnerships with cardiovascular disease, with the Health Department, with the Alan Turing Institute. Key to this is government. They're getting behind this. So the industrial strategy is a big thing in the UK. So Theresa May has announced 100 million pounds into genomics, about 40 million stuff into our stuff, and 72 million into centers of excellence in digital pathology, radiology, because we want, we, this needs to be industrial um, and at scale. So I'll finish there. So thank you very much. I won't go through our, I'll show you one more slide. Uh, I would like to be- For the local speakers, you don't get to do this. Yeah. It's only our guests. <laughs> so that's my last slide. We were doing so well, but then my director of communication says we can't be called HDR UK because havering and demolition and recycling have it. And they had the web domain. So uh, we had to buy it off them. So thank you very much. Thank you for that brilliant introduction and overview. I think as you go through the, the session, you're going to see a lot of similarities and connections to pieces of that. But they're not as connected and, and robustly aligned as we see in the sort of work that's taking place in the UK. So um, do, uh, do enjoy looking for that similarity. Um, now we're going to move into. Um, series of shorter talks. I'm going to try to be brief, just making sure that we have people connected and lined up. Um, but Mel Cashin is going to be speaking about sort of how we actually bring, bring these types of technologies to bear on actually making an impact on patients. Uh, and so the real world comes in that you can actually use this data to move things along in profound ways. And Mel's fought the battles for the last 10 years to find ways to work his way through these slogs and get over these lines and figure out how can we use these sorts of resources to move um, real treatment in the hepatitis space. So I think you're going to take us into that world and a little bit of the story you had along the way. So now, thanks know. for inviting me, and thanks, Wyatt, and you're a really tough act to follow. Um, so as, as we all know, uh, you get have more bugs with an agent. Life. You can have a short-term illness, it can be acute, or you can develop a chronic disease. And as you know, you can directly detect these agents by whom it's kind of technology. On the other hand, if you have an acute disease and it's transient, the only way you know if you've been infected is you can look for their antibody response or the cell-mediated immune response, and that's affected by the host immunosuppression and the agent and whether someone's been vaccinated. And again, you can use omics to try and understand whether you got infected by this agent and what it did to you. So fundamentally, you need diagnostic tools to understand both health and pathogens. So you've heard already that you need integrated data. And I'm going to use this Gordian knot. Unraveling the Gordian knot is really about trying to come up with solutions to complex or unsolvable problems. And it dates back to Alexander the Great in 333 BC, 
the Macedonian conqueror, marched his army into the Pythian uh, capital of Gordium, which is modern Turkey, and essentially encountered an ancient wagon with its yoke with several knots also tightly wound up that it was impossible to see how they were fastened. And that's fundamentally the challenge that we're all trying to solve. So the Gordian knot is really a metaphor for what is needed to unravel this omic correlates. And it's relevant for the hosts that interact with microbes. It's relevant for the genetics of cancer, the hereditary genetics, and personalized medicine. Fundamental to that is creating cohorts. And essentially, that's a group of people who share a characteristic. But in the real world, you share multiple characteristics. You have diabetes, you have infections, all of these things. And you can't separate them. And if you try to separate them, you'll come up with the wrong solution. And part of it is also to track the populations over their life course and end up being able to assess the outcomes like the Framingham studies. So over an 18-year experience, we created this hepatitis testers cohort from 92 to 2016. And we brought together health information on 1.7 million British drugs. Everyone who was tested for hep C in the country, HIV tested, diagnosed with hep B as a case or C as a case, DB cases, <coughs> HIV reported cases, and some enhanced surveillance. Link that in a safe manner to their prescription drugs, hospitalizations, medical visits, cancer registry, vital statistics, emergency department visits, and chronic disease. And essentially, we use that data to try and look at the disease trends, the program monitoring, the syndemics, which is how the multiple epidemics uh, are concurrent, and then measuring treatment effectiveness. So as you all know, and I'm going to use hep C as a case study, hep C is a blood-borne infection identified in 1989, now curable as a result of advances in molecular biology and pharmaceutical research. It's typically transmitted by people who inject drugs in developing countries and by both injection drug use and unsafe uh, injection practices in developing countries. If left untreated, about 15 to 25 percent will develop liver disease or other extra hepatic manifestations. And there were these older interferon-based treatments which essentially bolstered the innate immunity and could cure about 50% of those people. And now, because of these developments, you have these new uh, combination direct acting antivirals that can cure about 95% of people within 8 to 12 weeks, and there is a global hepatitis C elimination plan. So this figure, very simplistic, is a hepatitis cascade of care in British Columbia. And behind it is we've already removed the people who were diagnosed and died. So we have almost 60,000 people. We know what proportion actually got uh, diagnosed. We know what proportion got RNA tested. We know what proportion were RNA positive. Who was genotyped to help guide the therapy? Who was treated? And what was their cure rate? And behind this is where were they treated? What was their access? When were they diagnosed? And all of those components, which is invisible, but behind this data. What I want to show you here, and you're not going to be able to see it very well, is these new direct acting agents really were implemented in late 2014. And this is data to 2017. And essentially, what they show is if you weren't cured, these are survival curves, you do worse. And what you see is even within a few years, you can show the bending of the curve of someone who is cured in terms of all-cause mortality reductions, whether they have liver fibrosis or not. And the interesting thing is this is the older interferon-based therapy, which was given over the last 12 years. And the curves are actually identical. And although they look different here, if you control for their underlying disease and their duration of illness, the outcomes are identical. Everyone wants to solve this Gordian, Gordian knot, 
and fundamentally, uh, for us to understand when to use genomics, when to use tests, you need to be able to enable outcome and value assessments, both from a genomics perspective and for other tests. It, you need this to be able to understand the population impact of the tests based on the health services provided, which is exactly what you're trying to do. And it enables you to adjust for underlying comorbidities as well as social material deprivation. Because sometimes the resources need to go in to support certain populations whose voice isn't at the table. So fundamentally, what you can do is use this to monitor Hep C elimination. But as an example, the chickens that we eat and the chickens that get ground up into chicken nuggets that we feed our kids, 20% of them have salmonella. And the genomics can tell you the transmission between those chicken nuggets and humans. And although the vegetarians amongst you are rejoicing, <laughs> there is a huge outbreak uh, due to romaine lettuce with hamburger disease, E. coli, or N57. Similarly, the genomics can determine the transmission patterns, and the data integration is crucial to that public health response. So this is also equally relevant to unravel cancer and hereditary genomics, and I think I am on time. <laughs> so I would just end with one thing, no more slides, that BC sits on some tremendous data assets, but they're not brought together. And in, if we want to really move this agenda, we need to bring those assets together. Thank you. And that's a beautiful connection, as Andrew talked about, sort of the challenges of you can have this data, but if you can't actually access it in a way, it doesn't do you any good. So Mel found his way through it. He found a way to get a hold of the different pieces and connect the system together through, I think, sheer force of will. Uh, and so now it's how do you enable that and how do you make it easier? We're going to hear a little bit as we go along about some of those things. Um, now we're going to sort of shift gears a little bit and think about uh, the types of data that's coming out of, of different types of studies. One of the, the big populations that we identify in British Columbia that emerges constantly is, is kids who are challenged with autism, families that are challenged with autism. We have some real structural challenges in our system in terms of how we uh, identify those individuals. Uh, there's different health system benefits or system benefits to those families. Uh, there's pressure for certain diagnoses to be provided because of certain strange laws that were made uh, along the way. Uh, and so the community really is looking for better understanding of what's going on. And nationally, uh, Canada's been doing quite well in terms of trying to break through and figure out uh, the genetic underpinnings of autism. And one of the key projects is iTarget. And so I'd like to welcome um, Sorry, I'd like to welcome the speaker to talk about sort of the iTarget project and where these pieces fit together. So, thank you very much. Hi there, my name is Christina Talley, and I'd like to speak to you a little bit about a personalized medicine approach to autism. So, as Wyeth mentioned, this is a project that's based at BC Children's Hospital. I'd like to start with sort of a summary, because I think this project will touch on a number of themes that were discussed today. Firstly, in order to advance clinical implementation, it's imperative that research stems from the clinic and is patient centric. I manage my target autism initiative, which stands for individualized treatment for autism recovery using genetic and environmental targets. By recovery, we're not referring to a cure, but rather to individualized, personalized treatment that alleviate the most challenging symptoms of autism. My target is a growing interdisciplinary inter institute collaboration across BC and Canada with a six year plan to integrate clinical, genetic, as well as exposure and environment related omic data and microbiome mediated metabolic data with longitudinal treatment and therapeutic data in order to identify biomarkers that are predictive of therapeutic outcomes. This initiative is led by Dr. Suzanne Lewis, who is a medical gen geneticist in the Department of Medical Genetics at Children and Women's Health Center. We've also expanded now into the new first of its kind Autism Integrated Medical Services Clinic located in the Pacific Autism Family Network, which is in Richmond, BC. So these clinics, in addition to our partners with the DC Autism Assessment Network, facilitate not only recruitment, but also downstream clinical validation and translation of future findings into practice. Our partnership with LifeLab enables us to um, easily deep phenotype our cohort by coordinating the collection of clinical and research biosamples, which minimizes discomfort and increases the accessibility of research participation to individuals located throughout BC. Our partnership with the International Missing Study enables us to share whole genome sequence data 
with the Canadian and International Autism Research Committee. Both the raw data and the findings from our study will be stored in our centralized database called ASC Base, which is located in the Genome Sciences Center. And in subsequent phases, with the addition of longitudinal treatment and outcome data provided by the Ministry of Child and Family Development, Parents and Schools, we'll be able to perform validation studies of best fit treatments in order to ultimately inform government policy regarding autism. So as the accessibility of genomic information has evolved, it's become more and more evident that consistent, deep phenotyping is required in order to understand complex, heterogeneous conditions such as autism. As we're in the initial phase of our project, we're essentially compiling a complete medical history from conception through to current health status for each individual with autism. We're collecting whole genome sequence data as well as health and family history and behavioral and physical data for every individual as well as their parents, and additional blood, urine, and stool samples in order to extra data with the help of uh, Molecular U. So the integration of all of these data with the whole genome sequence data is being performed for Dr. Steve Jones's team at the Genome Sciences Center in collaboration with Dr. Bill Nolan from Microbiome Insights as well as Dr. Dave Wishart of the Metabolomics Innovation Center. So to integrate, um, the, oops, sorry, so uh, the organization of our database in this phase is essentially to allow us to easily capture data while we're interviewing a parent or performing a physical assessment on a person with autism. We have hundreds of fields of clinical and phenotype data from all relevant medical tests as well as behavioral and developmental assessments that have been captured in a consistent format using cons consistent definitions. Detailed physical assessments have all been performed by Dr. Lewis herself or a medical geneticist who she has trained. The integration of the clinical and phenomic data captured through our research has been challenging though as we're unable to directly extract data from hospital records. Therefore, these data are manually inputted from paper records and have to be independently double-checked, which is both time-consuming and very expensive. In order to assure consistency across published data sets and ease sharing of data down the road, we have ensured that all phenotype fields conform to the human phenotype ontology. In order to integrate clinical and research genomic data, reported findings from the clinical whole exome test are being inputted along with potentially significant findings identified through research both by re-examining the clinical whole, whole exome data as well as our whole genome sequences. These are, um, we're capturing the results of analyses performed by each member of the, uh, by each team working with this data in order, in order to advance the clinical analysis pipelines as well as enable us to share findings and compare findings for each participant quickly and easily. Data files such as individual metabolite protein, et cetera, are stored per individual to enable easy download and further analysis by our collaborators. Consent forms and other identifiable data, such as participant names, are encrypted and only viewable by Dr. Lewis's team with the support of being mock data. In summary, our management st strategy for big data will allow us to merge multiple data sets from clinical research and behavioral studies, unlocking siloed data to enable faster and better decisions, as well as facilitate input of data from families, research, and education communities, and build a longitudinal profile of each participant with multiple layers of data residing on top of the genome. The integration of this data will provide clinicians with further diagnostic tools, health management, and treatment guidelines that improve outcomes, as well as form pathways of predictions and the basis for guiding government policy that best practices based on a personalized and precision medicine approach that can be shared with the autism community. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge our vast number of collaborators and partners, especially Genome BC, for your funding, support, and invitation to speak today. Thank you, Christina. It's always interesting to see projects that are sort of getting off the ground and how much work is involved. So Christina's role in sort of trying to pull all these pieces and threads together into a fabric is, is very impressive. So it'll be interesting to compare notes between Christina and Mel as we go along at the different levels. Um, we're now going to move into um, the next talk, and, and uh, I'll make this a selfish moment while we're getting uh, Marco wired up. Uh, one of the joys that I get to have in my life is with all the titles I have, I get a lot of different bosses. And so it's always fun to get to introduce your boss uh, in his role as head of medical genetics at UBC. But more importantly for us as a whole in, in BC, Marco's really established British Columbia as a, a centerpiece for genomics in the world. And so when you think about our, our accomplishments and how Genome BC has, has taken off and how we sort of ruled the game in the Genome Canada competitions over the last uh, number of years, uh, it really all comes down to Marco and the infrastructure that he's developed and the people that he's developed along the way. So. It's going to take us, I think, into sort of the personalized oncogenomics world uh, in some of this presentation. So, Marco, without further ado. Thank you. I, I recorded that for my mother <laughs> <laughs> uh, shortly. 
so we were told not to dwell on a specific project, so of course I did. Uh, I want to talk to you about the BC Cancer's Personalized Genomics Project. And the reason I want to do it is because I think for me this idea of genomic testing and the results that you may are highly context dependent. And so I, I find it difficult to think about genomic testing broadly without considering context. So this is a cancer context, and really it's all about uh, the potential of whole genome analysis to support cancer treatment decision making. So cancer is a big deal. We all know this. It's the leading cause of mortality in Canada. Both the incidence and the prevalence are increasing. Uh, and my colleague, Dr. Regeer, once estimated that the annual uh, cost to treat cancer in this country is on the order of four billion. Uh, about half of uh, that cost is, is in the drug space. So we have increasing incidence, increasing prevalence, we have an expensive disease to treat, and the costs of new agents are increasing, as shown here. Data from the U.S. in which the median monthly costs for new agents are on the order of $10,000. And the situation is not so different here, I'm told. So we, we have uh, this peculiar disease cancer, and I, I would posit that cancer is a genomic problem. We know that cancer is amazingly heterogeneous across disease sites. Uh, we know that even within a disease site, there's enormous genetic heterogeneity, and we cannot predict by looking at the patient what the spectrum of genetic alterations might be. We have to measure them directly, which means comprehensive approaches are absolutely required. And in this vision, in which we integrate across data to produce improved cancer control, genomic data is only one of the data types that we need Somebody else said earlier, you know, outcomes are kind of important, well, they're critical, and we need to get much better at marrying them to genomic information. The approach we've established relies on, on uh, WGTA there at the top. This is whole genome and transcriptome information. And we already know from POG that we can use this information to identify previously unknown hereditary cancer families, so it's a spin-off benefit, maybe 15 to 70, 17 percent of the cases identify hereditary cancer family we didn't know about uh, before we sequenced a program. We know we can align patients to therapies, uh, not well. Uh, much improvement is needed there, largely related to the availability of off-labels. We could have a much bigger impact if we had access to those in different jurisdictions do it better than we. Uh, we are starting to be able to uh, measure patient outcomes. I'm going to show you Dr. Regeer's slide here. I'm deeply embedded in health action here, Sterling, so, you know, just to cut me some slack there. Now, this is not about saying that this is a clinical uh, implementation. This is a research project at this particular point, but I think we're starting to build some interesting nuances that would tell us that for certain indications, it's worth exploring a little bit more deeply. The point behind this slide is that most of the people listed here aren't genome scientists or any scientists uh, at all in, in the classic sense. So the first two uh, columns in a bit are all medical oncologists uh, within the province of British Columbia who have enrolled at least one patient on the program. We have radiology, we have medical genetics, pathology, and so on and so forth, uh, representing the POG team. So this is not about the Genome Science Center. It's certainly not about two or three guys thinking this is a good idea. This is an organization-wide uh, initiative to try, in this research project, to produce what whole genome and transcriptome analysis might setting. So the technical challenge, uh, reduced down to the genome level, is how do you take on the order of half a terabyte of sequence information uh, and then integrate that with all the other types of data and do this in a way that's robust and reliable and, and most importantly, timely? Can we stress test genomic pipelines to bring these data forward into the clinic? And so that's the thing that we're challenging ourselves with. Uh, not to say that we can do it convincingly yet, but that's where I think we need to go. So over the last six years of the POG program, uh, we've engineered a pipeline and reinformed the engineering of the pipeline multiple times, and now we have a thing uh, which uh, goes through the various steps here. I won't dwell on them, other than to say in 15 days we can now produce a report, which is at least the equivalent of any panel, uh, and maybe even all panels, uh, in 15 days it takes that half a terabase of information and integrates it into, yes, there's this variant, uh, yes, there's this variant, so on and so forth. Uh, even more exciting from my perspective has been the ability to create a 
molecular tumor board, which meets weekly. Uh, every Thursday for an hour, it's interdisciplinary, and we talk about cases. And that's done with the clinical community. That's not led by the genome scientists. That's led by the medical oncology community. So that can result in clinical action. Uh, equally exciting has been the creation of a hand-curated, painfully assembled uh, knowledge base, uh, which is both expanding and portable. This has been shared now uh, with entities in the United States, uh, and they're using it for their own purposes. CivicDB is an example of somebody that's slurped up all this information. So this is taking observations that we make on our patients, other observations that we collect from elsewhere, uh, so integrating these then to produce something that we can use uh, routinely in the POG program. So you see identified variants at the top of the figure. Uh, that's the things we measure, and they are then massaged into this curated reference, and inferences emerge, and in the event that they don't, uh, we go back into the literature and we try and find uh, rationales for the things that we're seeing. So right now, uh, this is a summary of what the data within this knowledge base look like. So about 10 billion rows. This is 1,000. Uh, patients in POG and a bunch of other data uh, elsewhere. The point, though, is that in BC alone, we have 25,000 new diagnoses of malignancy each year. So if this is all about 1,000 patients and the kind of data resources you'd like to analyze, just think of the volume that we're going to have to build. And we're already computing at the petabase or petabyte scale. Um, it's it's uh, going to require some much larger thinking than we have access to now, I think. So does it matter to patients? Well, we don't know. Uh, and so when we noodle about this within the POG team, we say, well, what does this whole genome and transcriptome stuff actually do? And so Dr. Regeer was very kind uh, to provide this beautiful slide, which seems to suggest that there may be, even in the populations in which we're working, these are all incurable cancer patients. Uh, many of them are, are advanced, uh, and there is some slight curve separation. So this gives us some encouragement uh, to dig deeper. Uh, so on that, uh, in terms of next steps, uh, we see now uh, a need to go very deeply into the economics and valuation of all of this. And so this is why Dean is a, a leader of the POG project. Uh, he is going to uh, inform us as to how we should go forward. And with that, uh, I would like to acknowledge all the generous support we've had from people over the years. Thank you. So POG has really emerged as one of the sort of models for how to approach these types of problems around the world. So it's very interesting to see how deeply we can go and, and where does the real value come out of it. It's early days, but it's very exciting to see there's a little bit of movement in that sort of broker sort of hype game. Uh, we're going to change a little bit of our focus, so we're now going to move into a sort of a view of, of data, data systems. And uh, when we think about sort of those Talks that we've heard already, there's been sort of indication of being able to touch in and connect to some of the underlying data systems that are out there. The ability to touch into prescriptions, the ability to touch into uh, population scale data, the types of core resources that we have for Columbia. And I think almost all of that revolves around Kim McGrail. So Kim is the head of Pop Data BC, and uh, in that role, she's out there with the government to try to get that data into the hands and make it accessible uh, in challenging ways. And, and she's been five years in. Two. Two in pop data in that role. Okay. So uh, Cam and I go back a while because uh, I had a weak moment one time when the university emailed me and said, would you like to chair a PhD exam? And for those of you who always reject those emails, uh, which is my usual thing, uh, I, I did accept it like one time. I said, I should do this sometime. And so I go in there, whose PhD do I get to chair? It was Kim McGrill. So. <laughs> uh, so that was a nice way to do this. But anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you because you're going to talk to us a little bit about how do we actually live in this world of Thank you very much, Vias, and thank you for the PhD. <laughs> and also, thank you to Marco, because I don't know who here has been to Hawaii, but I just love POG, and you have just sent me off into, like, Hawaii zone with it, so it's a juice that's made in Hawaii, and it tastes great with champagne, so. Okay, so, <laughs> coming back to this, this is going to be quite a different uh, bit of a talk, because I really do want to talk about how we might actually um, bring ourselves and our resources together to to achieve the kind of big science things that Andrew was talking about. And really just to um, remember, and I know all of you do, but I think it's good to remind ourselves that really we're all in this because we're trying to improve the health of individuals and the health of communities and the health of populations in general. 
But Andrew's right, there is an a, a avalanche of data coming at us, and a lot of us think generally about the healthcare system and the data that's generated in there, whether from um, service use or patients or genomics or whatever else it is. But there's also lots of other things that we need to know if we really truly want to understand that deep phenotype of individuals in our communities. So there's education information, there's the genomics, there's the, you know, where do you live, how much money do you have, um, do you happen to live in a place that uh, has air pollution or what are the other, other kinds of physical environment effects might there be? Um, where are you from? Uh, do you speak a different language? Did you immigrate to Canada? Uh, what's your activity, physical um, experience? Um, <laughs> that's your occupation. I put the village people in there. But that's <laughs> to signify where you work and what you do. And of course, this whole idea of the Internet of Things and the fact that we're actually being passively surveilled um, all the time uh, against our will in some cases. And, but that produces data that could potentially be of use to us. Now, and the interesting thing, and we're, we're thinking about this deep phenotyping and physical environment interacting with all of these other things, I just want to, uh, listening to Andrew talk, maybe think about a couple things. So one is um, the Framingham, so, such an interesting example. I don't know if anybody saw it. In the last week or so, I think there was an article in The Lancet that's suggesting that the Framingham risk prediction models are not actually working as well as we thought they were. They may be over predicting, well, leading to over treatment by something like 40 to 60 percent, depending on whether you're a man or a woman. And I'm not going to attest to the um, accuracy of this article, but it's an interesting little thought experiment because it turns out that the deep phenotyping was done on a community that was actually pretty similar in some ways, which I think co is code for most of them were white. And if we have different experiences based on a little bit more variety in our genetic makeup or background experience, whatever, then that may be leading us to um, inaccuracies in predictive um, algorithms, which goes back, to, again, then to thinking about what do we do with AI and predictive algorithms that are going to be even um, less transparent than the ones that are coming out of Framingham now. On the flip side of that, there was a recent article um, written by Philip Awadala and uh, his colleagues that used the um, Quebec version of the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow project, which has genomic information as well as all sorts of other uh, data on people. And they found that because they could focus their work in the Quebec cohort on a group of people who had been in that province for a very, very long time, if they're like, we're talking founder um, cohort, they were able to show that genetic expression was variant based on environmental exposures. So your risk of things, is it, it isn't really about that gene environment interaction in a very, very profound way. So there's, you know, there's different things that come out of these data, but it's really the combination of data that creates power to have insights that we didn't have before. Okay, so how many of you have heard about FAIR data, I promise not to turn this into a quiz. These FAIR principles? Okay, no, no, okay. so I'm just going to go um, through these. And I'm going to suggest that, um, just to be a little bit controversial perhaps, I think the days of open data are behind us, at least when we're talking about person-level information. Because the idea anymore that you can say that a data set is actually de-identified, once you put it out into the world and you can connect it with something else, you can't. I think it's just not a, a fair thing to say. So we, we need to be thinking about moving from this idea of open data to the idea of fair data. So what is fair? The F is findable. So, and, and all of these things really have a lot to do with metadata. So if you have a data set, and we want to we maximize the science that comes from, from all of the data we're collecting, we need to be able, thinking about reusing these data, putting them in a place putting metadata around them so that somebody else can come along, connect them to all sorts of other things, and, and um, produce the kind of uh, innovative uh, scientific findings that we're looking for. So findable. We've got to put metadata on these things so we understand what's in the data, what it shows us, who it's about, how it might be used. The A is for accessible. So this means that the metadata needs to be understandable both by humans and by machines. The interoperable, which is something Andrew had already talked about. So this is the idea that um, you can bring the, met the, the data together, that, the met that you're using a metadata system that actually is some kind of general standard. 
you're not just sort of homegrowning something that nobody else is going to understand or be able to use. And then the reusable part. And so that we have a way, we understand what the governance around data sets are or is, and we then know how to get access to them. So why do we want to do um, the, use these fair principles, put our data in places where we can reuse them? One is to maximize investments, and the second is to ensure that we can get all the value we can out of these data. This is huge public investment in the data that we're using today. It needs to be reused and reused and reused to maximum benefit. So how? One is collective commitment. I think that we need to start to devalue the, the um, I think we put too much value on people having their own databases in their own computers in their own labs. We need to be moving to what Andrew was talking about as more of a collective environment where the analysis goes to the data rather than the data coming to the analysis. And I think we need some specified repositories. There's no way this is all going to be one repository. I wouldn't find, um, even suggest that, but it should be a federated system of specified repositories. And there needs to be some thought to this about at end of grant, um, when it's time, when you're project is done, um, you need to be thinking about that pathway for moving your data into a system where other people can access it. And that's it. Thank you very much.